So we're going to have Chris come up and bring the word. So Chris. Well, well, I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for us that we hear. And seriously, that we hear. We just don't, it's not about his delivery. It's not about anything like that or prep. It's about do we have hearts to hear what God wants to say to us today. Um, that's important. So, Father, Lord, I just I do lift, lift up Chris. I thank you for what you have been sowing in his heart. And, Lord, as he leans into you, as what he's saying, uh, leaning into the arms of Jesus, that as he leans into you and listens to what your heart is saying for us, I just pray for our confidence as he speaks. And I thank you for the giftings you have given him, the wisdom, the insight, and clarity. And Father, for us, Lord, would I pray for us to have hearts that are open to hear. To hear, not just to say, it's, it, oh, that was a good message, but for it to shape our hearts. For it to shape how we live our lives before you. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you teach us, your way, the Jesus way. In your name we pray. Amen. It's yours. Thank you. Well, it's good that Scott prayed that uh, <clears throat> it's not about the preparation because, to be honest, my preparation was absolute garbage, and I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> so uh, I've known that I've been preaching on Jacob for probably about uh, two, three months now. And so I always had it in my calendar over the last little while, this schedule time to, you know, look into it, start doing it, all that kind of stuff. And every time I would go to do it, I really felt like God was actually telling me, don't really prepare, which for me is not really that scary because that's kind of how I like to fly most of the time as well. But I did prepare a little bit, so don't worry, it won't be too, too off track. But, but I just felt God call me to, to rest, right? Don't prepare, rest, right? And so basically what I did was I spent some time just reading over the story of Jacob, specifically when he um, steals his, the birthright from Esau and kind of that, that four or five chapters there and just really letting the Lord speak to me on, on, on that story. And through that, even going into yesterday morning, I was like, man, I really have no idea what I'm going to say. And uh, I still don't know exactly where we're going to end off, but Jude and Gwen, there's a test this afternoon, so make sure that you're paying attention to what I say, okay? Yes, Gwen's probably gone. Yeah, she's out there. So I have the lovely pleasure of not only teaching you guys, but entertaining my children all in the same time. So we will see how this goes. So I think what I want to do first is just give an overview of kind of that story of Jacob and how he steals uh, the birthright from Esau. Um, and then kind of I'll get, well, I guess I'll tell you what my main point is before we get started. And then we can talk about that. So really throughout this story of, of Jacob, what I came to see is that the destiny that God has called us into is not based on where we are today, but who we're becoming. Right? And going back to the whole sermon series that we're talking about is that this is really the definition in my mind that shows the hero that Jesus is. It's because it's out of the grace and freedom that he's freely given us that actually propels us into destiny, not anything of who we are today. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a really good thing because who I am today is probably not who I need to become for what God has called us to. Right? So just to kind of... Um, I'll give an overview of the, the four chapters, and then we'll read some scripture throughout. So basically, the story goes that um, Isaac is sick. So um, Isaac's sick. He's about to die. He goes to his oldest son, Esau, and says, go out, find a, you know, go hunt, find a big meal, make a big meal for me so that I can bless you, basically, because you're the oldest. And so Rebecca, interestingly enough, Rebecca he overhears this and goes to Jacob and tells Jacob to basically go prepare a meal, dress up, and pretend to be Esau to take his birthright so that Isaac will bless him. Which, just interestingly enough, I, I never really perceived the story in this way. I always thought, ah, oh, Jacob the deceiver, right? Well, yeah, there's some deceitfulness in Jacob, but the initiator of the deceit was surely not Jacob. It was actually Rebecca, which is an interesting thing because there's a level of naivety that I see in Jacob in the beginning of this story in his deceitfulness, which I think we can all identify to some naivety in our deceitfulness or our sin sometimes. So anyway, so he does, he does that. He does lie to Isaac. Isaac blesses him. Um, he realizes, Esau realizes, 
Um, obviously, Esau is very mad. He utters words like, if I ever see Jacob's face again, I'm going to kill him. Rebecca hears this and then sends him off to uh, go to his uncle Laban's house, um, basically to go there for refuge. So he goes there. He uh, finds Rebecca, who he falls in love with, Laban's daughter. Um, and then he says, I'll work for seven years for you, Laban, if I can have her um, in, in marriage. Um, Laban says, okay. Laban then deceives uh, Jacob by giving him his other daughter Leah instead of instead of Rachel again interestingly enough that the deceiver was deceived and he received some of the same treatment that you know he was he was given to or he was uh, doing to Esau um, so that happens there's kind of a, some interchanges obviously between Laban and Jacob Jacob runs away Laban goes after him God then comes to Laban in a dream and says, do not do anything good or bad to Jacob. Basically, leave him alone. And then so uh, Jacob keeps on going with his family. And then he comes to going back and entering the land where Esau is. And again, just understanding and acknowledging the situation here is that Jacob knows that Esau's last words basically were that if he ever sees him back in this land, he's going to kill him. And Jacob is freely going there because God called him to go back to this land. So I'm kind of going to stop there and we'll talk about what happens after that point further down. But I just want to really talk about a couple things around showing that, that, that really the thing that God has called Jacob to, right, really precludes him doing anything good or great. And it is actually out of the grace of who God is that he actually calls Jacob into what he he becomes. And before we get into that, though, I do want to make a point of something that is very interesting. I'll give credit to my mom for this because she was the one who, who, who kind of we were talking about it. So when I was talking to my mom a little bit about Jacob, she said one of the really cool things and interesting things is that later on in the Bible and throughout Scripture, specifically I have a, 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 a verse from Matthew 22, is that... Jesus refers to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is very interesting because Jacob's name in this story actually gets changed to Israel. And so why is Jesus referencing Jacob's name as Jacob and not as Israel, which I would view as the more restored version of who he probably became? So kind of the verse says here, and this is in the context of Jesus is talking to the Sadducees, um, and basically says, Jesus replied, uh, you're in error because uh, you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will never marry nor be given marriage. This is when he's addressing them about um, kind of when, when we die and, you know, a bunch of brothers die. Whose wife is this? Basically that part. Um, but he says they will be like angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not heard what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of, de of the dead, but the God of the living. And there's many references where God references the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He always says Jacob, which is just so interesting from my perspective, because to me what that says is there's, there's always intentionality in the words God uses and, and that are in Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is some level of understanding who Jacob was that kind of sticks with me in the fact that he's referred to as Jacob still. That, that God doesn't see Jacob as the deceiver, even though he still uses his name and not Israel. That, that there's just some level of understanding of the process that he went through. That's how, that's how I read it, at least. And so, again, not totally what I want to focus on this morning, but really interesting that, that God refers to him, as Jesus refers to him as Jacob, not Israel, right? And so I think for us, you know, as we are on this, this path of becoming who God is calling us to be is that, you know, we don't need to be who God's calling us to be in five years now to start walking in what he has for us, right? So the first part in, uh, in the story of Jacob that really kind of comes across to me as really important for this whole concept is that, so after Jacob uh, deceives Isaac and gets blessed and is actually starting to run away to Laban's house, that night, this is the verse, uh, a couple verses here that I'll read, that says what happens when he, when he sets out on his journey. So, uh, Jacob left, left and set out to Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down 
uh, lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its, uh, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are lying. Your descendants will be <clears throat> like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out, uh, at a, out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave until I have done what I have promised you. So a couple things here is that the blessing that Jacob received from Isaac was a blessing that seemed to be meant for Esau and was only given to to Jacob because of the deceitfulness of him and Rebekah. Yet, God meets him the night after, or very soon after this happens, and basically confirms the blessing that was stolen. And two, that blessing and the words that God is using there reminds me a lot of the exact same covenant that he made with Abraham, right? About talking about descendants and and, and a promise of this land, right? And it's just so interesting to me, you know, we have this whole equation, right? If I do this and I'm good here and I do all the Christian things, then therefore there's a blessing for me. Well, this would challenge that subject because out of deceitfulness, out of trickery, out of theft, came a blessing from the Lord. And a blessing from the Lord that really is very similar to Isaac and Abraham's blessing. So much so that throughout Scripture, Jesus refers to God as not the God of Abraham and Isaac because Jacob was deceitful. No, he, refer, he puts Jacob in that group with Abraham and Isaac. And so, kind of as I look at this, you know, and, and look at how is this applicable for my life, is that it's so easy for us to think that the calling of God is a straight line. And I think all of us who have you know, walked this journey for long enough realize that it's absolutely not a straight line. And that but us, our actions, our feelings, the, the things that we choose to do sometimes are very counterintuitive um, to what we feel that we've been called to do. And, and just an encouragement that just because we fall short, as we frankly always do, that the grace and freedom that God has given us does not exclude us from the destiny he's called us to, right? And, and when there's been words spoken over your lives or feelings that you have about what God's called you to, is that that's a promise and a covenant that he's made with you. And, you know, are there certain situations where we can maybe walk away from that going, well, I don't know, maybe you got to live a lifetime to probably make that, that, uh, that point. But what I would argue is, is that don't get discouraged just because you feel like you've fallen off the path of what God's called you to. Because we all go through seasons. And what this shows me very much is God's kindness towards Jacob. And remember, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same, the same God. You can see this here. Is there a lot of judgment and feelings of all that kind of stuff throughout the Old Testament sometimes? Yeah, there is. But look at the kindness to Jacob. Out of sin, out of deceitfulness, the kindness that God meets him and shows him. It's just, it was just so interesting to me reading that point. And then again, moving further on, when Jacob is at Laban's house and he's being deceived by by Laban and tricking him and all these things are going on, like God is obviously so with Jacob through that. And so the reason why Jacob ends up actually leaving Laban's house is again, God meets him. Excuse me, I'm going to get some water. Singing and uh, preaching, this was bound to happen. Um, he, God comes to Jacob in a dream and, and calls him back to the, the land, right, that, where he came from. And again, just that whole concept that in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of all these things going on, that God never left Jacob. Right? He was always with Jacob. And again, to the calling and what we're going through, right? just because God has called us to something, in no way, shape, or form means that it's going to be easy. Right? Or again, that straight line. He had to leave his land, go and work for seven years with, or it was, sorry, it was way more than seven years because he got tricked by Laban, but work for all this time with Laban to not get really what he thought he was getting. And in the end, he did get it. But, you know what I mean? God was with him, and he had to go do that and go through all that turmoil to actually walk back into what God had called him to. And you think about it, is that when he goes, uh, when he's walking back to 
the land where he's going to meet Esau, and he wrestles with a man or God or whatever you want to interpret that to be. I'm not a scholar, so I'll just, it says a man in lots of translations. I don't know what that is. But <clears throat> long story short is that that is where he, it becomes, his name gets changed to Israel. Through the wrestling with, oh, let's say God, because he, he says he won't tell him his name, so I'm going to assume it's God, um, is that, you know, Jacob would not have received that blessing of, is, of becoming Israel if he had not walked through all of those things that had happened. And again, the kindness of God towards the deceiver, as we would like to call him, and label him as something that we would never do. Now, as we get further on in the story of Jacob, as he, <coughs> excuse me, as he uh, goes back to the land um, where Esau is, you know, you have Jacob at the beginning of this story who Frankly, I interpret some pride and admiration and aspiration to be more than what he ought to be as some characteristics of who he is. But to go back into the land where Esau is, there's one leading quality that, that he had to have had to do it, and that is humility. And, and the, the call of God really has to be stewarded by one main quality, and that is humility. And so this... Um, just this is the posture that Jacob takes. So this is from uh, Genesis 32, 3 to 5. So Jacob sent messengers ahead of his brother, um, ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir. Sir? Yeah. Something. I'm not, this is where I'm really bad. Some kind of land. The country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are t to say to my Lord Esau. So he's calling the brother who he stole his, the, his birthright from Lord Interesting. Your servant Jacob, interesting. Labeling himself as a servant. Not, not a lord, not one who stole the birthright. I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my lord that I might fi may find favor in your eyes. So when you look and hear the language that Jacob starts to begin to use... Is there fear behind it? Of course there is. He thinks his brother's going to murder him. So yes, there's an element of fear to it. But, but the fact that Jacob's language by calling him, and again, he's saying this to his own people, not to Esau. This is what you are to say to my Lord Esau. He is telling his people when Esau is not even there that Esau is, is his Lord. He's not talking to Esau. He's not groveling right now to Esau and trying to appease him by saying, oh Lord, don't kill me. He's actually addressing it with his people and setting and setting the precedent for his people that Esau is Lord. And then he calls himself a servant. And I think one thing that I would <clears throat> just hit home one more on this point of humility. We're all called to different things in different capacities in different ways. And everybody's calling. It's like, it's like when... Um, when they talk about, you know, in the church, right? Everybody's got a part, right? Some people are eyes, some people are hair, some people are arms, right? And it's easy for us to think of the difference of importance of calling. And I think what is really important to guard our hearts against is that just because you might have been called to something, uh, quote unquote, greater or bigger or more grander than anybody else, doesn't mean that that is a, um, a hall pass to lack humility. Actually, it's a call to have way more humility. So, you know, we talk about calling in the church a lot, right? What am I called to do all this kind of stuff? Well, we're first called to love and grace, and I would, I would argue almost equally, humility has to follow with those characteristics. So as, as you walk out your calling or seek your calling, if it's not led by love, grace, and humility, you have a fundamental disconnect with where I believe God would be calling you to do in whatever sphere. Because this is a very, very good tangible example to show that humility is the leading quality to restoration. Right? And God came to restore. That is the ultimate thing that God came to do, right? He came to restore us in relationship to him. 
That's what Jesus did. That's why Jesus is a hero, because he came in grace and freedom to give us something we didn't deserve to restore what he really ultimately wanted for us all along, which is relationship, right? And as we go, and I'll read some scripture more about what happens with Jacob and Esau, is like Jacob and Esau are like a tangible representation of the restoration that God has for us, for his people, for our relationships, because it's filled with anger and and hate in the beginning, which is frankly the posture that our hearts were towards God, right? We put him on the cross, right? We we did that. We we killed him. We didn't want anything to do with him, but he still said, no, I, I want to build a relationship with you. I want to restore that. So this is some of the scripture that talks about when they meet each other. So <clears throat> Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men, which probably could have easily murdered everybody that was there. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. He went ahead, he went first, he postured himself in humility. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are, who are these with you, he asked. They are the children God has graciously given your servant. <clears throat> There's a lot, for me, there's a lot of actually parallels um, to the prodigal son parable in that moment right there, right? There's, there is restoration when somebody took a birthright and an inheritance left, basically spit on their family and came back. And what was he met with? He was met with embrace rather than condemnation. Where Esau obviously had the men, the army to do whatever he wanted to, probably to Jacob, he chose to embrace him. And the one thing that I do, I, I sometimes really frustrates me about the Bible, is I'd love to know Esau's story. Because it is so interesting that all of a sudden, right, you know, we don't hear anything about Esau throughout this whole time, and then all of a sudden he's, you know, coming to embrace his brother. Uh, who knows what happened there? But obviously there was a change in posture. Obviously there, there is, again, kindness towards Jacob through Esau. And then there's another part here. So obviously Jacob you know, was giving all his, um, these flocks and herds to, uh, to Esau. So, but Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds? And Jacob says, to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what, you're, what you have for yourself. And so there's like uh, maybe four verse gap. And then this is the next thing that comes after that. It says, Esau said, because um, this is when Jacob's saying that he's going to stay and go to another, uh, another place. And Esau says, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why would you do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. Which is basically the exact same thing that Jacob said to Esau when he was talking about giving him his flock. So, you know, from that, Jacob really deserved judgment from Esau, but Esau gave him protection. The men that Jacob thought were coming to kill him actually were left for protection. And the reciprocation of Jacob striving to find favor in the eyes of Esau, and then Esau to find favor in the eyes of my Lord, again, just a very interesting thing and exchange between the two of these these brothers who do I mean that the other brothers that we have example of in Genesis before this this type of relationship turned into murder right whereas Jacob and Esau frankly are 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 almost a, a yin and yang to Cain and Abel in terms of Cain and Abel almost are a visible representation of the world without God and J and Jacob and Esau are a visible representation of what God came to do restore Restore what was broken, not judge and murder and destroy what was broken, which is what Cain did. So 
So, you know, all in all, I think the big thing for me that stuck, that stuck out from just rereading and getting back in to this story about Jacob and, and really the whole sermon series that, that the team wanted us to look at is there's aspects of, of who Jacob was in me. There is deceitfulness. There is fear. There is, you know, striving for things that are probably not mine. There's pride. There's all these things that, frankly, live inside all of us. And that is why Jacob is not a hero in the Bible. Even though he is he's talked about as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob is no better and no worse than we are. But it is because of the kindness of God that he was shown and we are shown today that make Jesus and what he did the real hero of Scripture. Because, frankly... We don't deserve any of the blessing that we have. We are given that out of grace and kindness of what Jesus came to do on the cross. And so Jacob for me is, you know, there is that sense of, of, of innocence around, around his deceitfulness. And so I would, I would caution us that I believe we need to develop a real awareness around our hearts and our posture because yes there's blessing but also you know we don't you know just sin so that grace can keep abounding right that's that's what Paul talks about but that God has called us to greater things and he called us to do better not because we have to to get something from him but because out of the love that he already showed us and the kindness he gives us all the time that's why we serve him. That's why he's the hero, because it's not about us. It's all about him. Yeah. That's all I got. My, my vo- and my voice is going to start dying in a second. So, yeah, I got to call the worship team up. They're delaying here. <coughs> so, I will do my best to try and sing a song. We'll see how it goes. But um, I'll just pray and... Uh, yeah, if you just want to hold your hands out if you're comfortable. Let's just, you know, it's, it's fine for me to speak words, but they might be garbage. So let's see what the Lord wants to keep on our hearts and put on our hearts this morning. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. Lord, the kindness and generosity that you showed Jacob reminds me, reminds us, Lord, that, that, you, that you frankly are kind beyond our imagination. And that Jesus going to the cross and doing what he did, Lord, it's just a, a confirming and, and the next step and the next level of that kindness and grace and freedom. But just to be really clear, we know, Lord, that you have been kind from the beginning. That your kindness does not just, just, just start at Jesus, Lord. Your kindness has existed since the beginning of time. You just look at your, the kindness from Ad, to Adam and Eve. Lord, and, and we just... Lord, we just say and we repent for when we have, Lord, displayed you to others as a God who is not kind. And Lord, if we want to see people saved, if we want to see people to come to know you, let's lead with grace and freedom and love. Because judgment is not, it's not what it's about. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. And the reason the Holy Spirit convicts is because he doesn't only convict, but he gives the power to change. So, Lord, I just pray as we, as we just sing this last song, Lord, I just pray that you would just speak to us about, Lord, what you've called us to and how we need to walk that out.
eyes in every sunrise the colors of the morning are inside your eyes the world awakens in the light of the day i look up to the sky and say you're beautiful are in motion and galaxies are bright we are amazed in the light of the stars it's all proclaiming who you are you're beautiful oh, 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 oh. this if you've never made that solid decision to make Jesus Lord of your life but you're feeling this tug you're feeling this something that is pulling on your heart right now it is the kindness of God that you're sensing that God is reaching out to you that God is longing for you and so I would just don't, don't, don't dismiss. 
miss that tug of your heart. That deep place where you sense something pulling you. I invite you to say yes to Jesus. To walk the Jesus way. It's the way of life. It's the way of restoration. It's the way of where relationships are brought together. It's as Chris pointed out to us so eloquently, saying that Abel and Cain almost is a picture of a world without God, but Jacob and Esau is a picture of a world with God. That a God who comes to bring restoration, comes to bring that shalom, that peace, that is completeness in our lives. I want you just to sit with that right now. I also just have a sense for those of us who are followers of, of Jesus, we're following. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that has been splintered. Maybe it's something that you're holding that, you know, it's just maybe yourself caught up in something. And it's easy sometimes to disqualify ourselves and to walk away. But I'm saying to you this morning that the kindness of God is speaking to you. To turn to God, to turn to, to, to bring that, that, to bring all that stuff to God. Because what we saw throughout this series is people, just as they were, but they leaned into God. They were people who are examples of what it means to be a life of faith. Because they knew God was there for them. And you see restoration taking place. Don't disqualify yourself. Because God takes those things, takes those moments of deceit, those times of brokenness, and God, and if we turn to God, God can take that and restore and bring wholeness. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your kindness. Lord, as we go about our days this coming week, this month, be it at work or in our homes or in our neighborhood or wherever, whatever we're doing. Lord, let us look for the, your kindness. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Your creation speaks of your kindness. We thank you for that. In fact, we're forever grateful for it. It's what brings us hope. And Lord, for those who have said, they felt that tug and they've said yes. And Jesus, I just, I just pray, Lord, that Lord, that they just, that I, I pray that they just start walking towards you, your way. Because Lord, your way brings life. It is life. There is no other life outside of your way. And so we thank you, Lord, for what, you, what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. So we say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit right now. Be present with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Scott. I believe that the Lord wants to bring healing to somebody's knee. Okay, so if there's anyone in this room who's having knee problems, um, if you could just like stand up and we'll pray for you. Or if it's somebody online, this is called a uh, word of knowledge with a step of faith. So I believe it's a knee inside uh, tendon perhaps. Um, so yeah. All right. Some people want to gather around Catherine there. We'll pray for healing. Awesome. 
So we just, well, I just want to speak to the folks online. Uh, thank you for joining with us, but also to all, to to those of us. If you have said a yes to Jesus, you need to gather with a faith community, be it us or be it a smaller group of people. But we all need help to walk the journey. We need that. We need it, and because uh, there's no life like it. So we bless you guys. Thank you for being with us today. And again, if you need prayer, um, just let us know by either putting your hand up or coming up here at the front. You can sit down one of the chairs and, and one of our leaders will come alongside and just pray with you and for you. So bless you.